Welcome to Biomaterials. So today we're going to be continuing our discussion of surface tension. And in particular today we're going to be talking about the surface tension and its interpretation as an energy per unit area. But before we do that, Let's talk, let's just do a quick review of last time's interpretation of surface tension as a force per unit length. So surface tension has these two interpretations, one as an energy per area and the other as a force per length. So in this force per length interpretation, we, we talked about surface tension um, in the context of how a droplet might interact with the surface. So let's say I had some surface here and a droplet on that surface, and then maybe I had a surface of a different material over here and a droplet on that surface. So let's say I had a hydrophobic surface and a hydrophilic surface, and put a droplet on those, and up here we're sort of doing a side view here, um, and up here I had air in both cases, so I'm looking at these surfaces from the side, on a hydrophobic surface, we know that droplets tend to bead up like this, and on a hydrophilic surface, they tend to stretch out uh, a little bit more. One thing that we can measure about these two circumstances is the contact angle. So if we draw a line that's tangent to the surface and intersects the contact point, we can say, hey, there's some angle there's some angle in that um, in that surface, and or in you know some angle that this line makes with the solid surface, and of, well, I guess it, there are two angles that are complementary, but the by definition, the angle that this contact line makes with the surface in the fluid part of that interface is this angle theta, and we call this the contact angle. A contact angle also exists for the hydrophobic surface, and in this case we draw the tangent line, and this hydrophobic surface has a much larger contact angle. So if we look at these two surfaces here, there's a hydrophobic surface with a large contact angle, a hydrophilic surface with a small contact angle, and if we fall back on this force per unit length interpretation, we basically say, hey, wait a second, you know, these surfaces are basically all tugging on this contact point to try to move it around. So there's some surface tension between the air and the solid, and that's trying to pull the contact point this way. And there's some surface tension between the liquid and the solid, and that's trying to pull the contact point this way. And there's some contact between, uh, some surface tension between the air and the liquid, and that's trying to pull the surface this way. And when these three forces are in equilibrium, this contact point stays where it is, the contact angle um, achieves some equilibrium contact angle, and that contact angle, based on the balance of those three surface tensions, might be different depending on the magnitude of the solid vapor surface tension, the liquid vapor surface tension, and the solid liquid surface tension. So you don't need to take my word for it that these. Um, so you don't need to make take my word for it that hydrophobic surfaces tend to have very rounded up droplets that are trying to minimize the amount of area between them. So hydrophobic surfaces have very rounded droplets with very large contact angles, and hydrophilic surfaces tend to have very stretched out droplets with very small contact angles. We can see this in real life. So here I have a demo. I have two surfaces. One is this glass pie dish, and the other is this plastic soda bottle. So a lot of plastics, particularly polyethylene terephthalate, like this that this plastic soda bottle is made up of, tend to be pretty hydrophobic. So they have a lot of carbon-hydrogen bonds or carbon-carbon bonds, and those carbon-carbon bonds tend to be pretty nonpolar, so they result in a very hydrophobic material. So we can see here there's a contact, there's a droplet. I, it's just water with a little bit of green food dye in it. And 
this, you can see the contact angle here is about 90 degrees, give or take a little bit. Maybe a little bit less. Then we can go on over to this pie dish right here that also has water with a little bit of green food dye in it. And if we look, I'll try to get a side profile right here. But if we look at the droplet, I'll try to get some focus on the droplet. If we try to look at this droplet right here and look at it from the side, you can see the contact angle is a lot shallower. You can see that's a much shallower contact angle than the plastic, which had a pretty steep contact angle. So what physics are involved here? So basically a low a low surface tension um, basically means that there is a favorable favorable interaction between the two phases, be it a solid vapor or a liquid vapor or a solid liquid. If there's a low surface tension between the two types of materials, then there's a favorable interaction between them. And that's consistent right here. So in this case, if we have a hydrophilic material, there's a favorable interaction between the liquid and the solid. So there's only a little bit of surface tension that's trying to pull the contact um, this way. Whereas there might be more surface tension between the um, solid and the vapor or between the liquid and the vapor. So in that case, there's a very low contact angle because these two forces together need to balance this one. Whereas in this case, if there's a relatively unfavorable interaction between a hydrophobic solid and the fluid right here, then there's not that much force, um, uh, or then there's, then there's a lot, sorry, then there's a lot of force pulling this way, and we need both of these forces over here to balance out that surface tension. So that is the, that's the essence of this force over length interpretation of surface tension. But Professor Lennon, you say, hey, wait a second. Here you are talking all about this force versus length interpretation of surface tension, but you promised to talk about the energy per unit area interpretation of surface tension. So let's talk a little bit about this. So I'm going to draw these two cases again, hydrophobic and a hydrophilic surface with a droplet on it. And that's going to help us um, describe this energy per unit area interpretation of surface tension. So here I am, a hydrophilic surface with a low contact angle droplet on it, and a hydrophobic surface with a high contact angle droplet on it. So here we are, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, and similarly a very high and a very low contact angle. So when we're thinking about these two droplets, we can draw a control volume around these systems. And we can think about the total surface energy of one system versus the other system. And when we're doing this energy per unit area interpretation, this energy per area interpretation of surface tension, we think about these systems try to minimize The systems try to minimize their overall energy. We can think about this as like a ball rolling downhill and trying to occupy um, the minimum potential energy of a system. <coughs> we can think about droplets moving around, changing their shape in order to try to minimize their overall um, energy associated with surface tension. So if we think about surface energy, which maybe I'll give the letter E and a little subscript surf to basically say it's uh, energy associated with surfaces, the surface energy would basically, if surface tension is energy per unit area, then if I multiply each area, the area of each interface 
times that area's respective surface tension, then the energy per area times an area of an interface will give me the surface energy. So for example, there's, uh, three, there's three areas and three surface tensions that we need to worry about. So what three surfaces do we need to worry about? Well, let's do a little color coding. So let's say there's a solid, in either of these circumstances, there's a solid vapor interface, which I'll color code green right here. Sorry, there's a, there's a solid, uh, there's a solid liquid interface, which I'm going to color code red. Sorry, changing my colors here. There's a solid liquid surface, which I'm going to color code red. There's a solid liquid interface. There's a solid vapor interface, which I'll color code green. And then there's also a liquid vapor interface, which I could color code blue. And if surface tension is energy per area, then I can get the surface energy by multiplying the surface tension times that surface's respective area. So um, how do we go about doing this? Well, there's some, let's say, uh, there's an area of the solid liquid interface. And if I multiply that area by the surface tension, by the solid liquid surface tension, that this product essentially gives me the energy associated with this interface or with this interface for these two respective systems. Um, but this isn't the only uh, surface energy which contributes to the overall surface energy. There's also a contribution from the solid, uh, from the solid vapor area. So there's, let's say, some area here that the solid part is in contact with the vapor. So there's some solid vapor area and some solid vapor surface tension associated that, that arises from the, the chemistry of the gas and the chemistry of the solid. And there's a an contribution to the overall surface energy associated with this interface. And then similarly, there's also an area of the liquid vapor interface and a surface tension associated with the liquid uh, with the chemistry of the liquid and the chemistry of the vapor, so there's some surface tension associated with that. So the overall surface energy are, is the sum of the solid liquid surface energy, the solid vapor surface energy, and the liquid vapor surface energy, as given by these three products right here, all added up. So consistent with what I described here, low surface tension being a favorable interaction, uh, the, the opposite, so a high surface tension um, is essentially a big penalty to the overall energy, right? So these, these droplets are trying to occupy the low, they're trying to minimize their overall energy. So if, for example, a surface tension is really high, then it's going to try to keep the area low. So if surface tension is high, the system tries, I'll put that in quotes because again, it's physics, it's not really making a choice. Uh, if surface tension is high, the system tries to keep area low associated with that interface. So for example, over here, we have a hydrophilic surface. Um, and the hydrophilic surface, this one right here, this surface has a, a low uh, solid liquid surface tension. And because this surface has a low solid liquid surface tension, it can afford to have a high area. And this one, on the other hand, has a high solid liquid surface tension because it's an unfavorable interaction between a hydrophobic solid and this, and this water, which would be a polar liquid. So there's a high solid liquid surface tension. And 
So this droplet is trying to keep this area as small as possible because it doesn't want to pay a huge penalty to its overall surface energy by having this interaction. So you can think about surface tension whatever you want, right? You can think about it as a battle of forces where the forces are acting on the contact line and moving that contact line until, it's, uh, until the contact angle gives, um, gives an appropriate equilibrium between these forces tugging on the contact line. Or you could think about the, the fluid, the liquid, wiggling itself around, changing its shape until it's occupied its lowest energy state. And this lower, lowest energy state essentially being a balance between the areas of these three interfaces and the penalties, the prices that it pays for each of them, right? So for example, this, this droplet here stretches out because it doesn't need to pay a very big price for contact between the liquid and the solid, um, and it's, uh, but it might sort of increase some other areas. So it you know, decreases a solid vapor interface, it increases a solid liquid interface, and it, overall, it's kind of paying the lowest price um, for, uh, to occupy this state as compared to another one. Whereas, uh, and if you change the prices, i.e. change the surface tensions, then that's gonna change the shape of the drop droplet to try to find a different way, a different shape that minimizes its overall surface energy. So why do we care, right? You know, why are we, why are we bother, why do we bother even having two interpretations? Why do we even bother with this energy per area interpretation? Well, one, it helps us explain physical phenomena, like what, why droplets take sh certain shapes. But from a more quantitative perspective, it allows us to predict, uh, to predict physical phenomena. And actually, one of the most interesting physical phenomena that we can predict using this energy per area interpretation is that of capillary rise. So you might have noticed that if you have, um, if you have a, a glass full of liquid, for example, water with a little bit of green food coloring in it, and you look at and you put a straw in that liquid, you put a straw in that liquid, you might see that the fluid actually rises up to a higher level inside the straw than outside of it. And even if I move the straw around, basically the, the liquid occupies a similar equilibrium level. So I'm not, you know, the top of the straw is totally open. I'm not doing any funny games, right? I'm not doing this thing where I'm trying to pull up the liquid by, by closing off the top of the straw. Nope, I'm opening the top of the straw. It's just a surface tension phenomenon that draws up a little bit of liquid into the straw. And again, this isn't like a perpetual motion machine. It's not, it's not like a pump. It's not like the fluid is constantly being drawn up, but there's the, uh, the straw, a little bit of liquid gets drawn up into the straw in order to try to minimize the overall system energy. So why do we care about liquids going up into straws? Well, we might care about this. Uh, we might care about this phenomenon, this phenomenon of capillary rise. We might care about this uh, phenomenon of capillary rise by which liquid goes up into a straw. We might care about this for a couple of reasons. One, it's the, it's the way that trees or plants drink water. It's the way, it's the, the, how they were sort of able to pull water up from their roots into their leaves. Um, they do so <coughs> via capillary rise. Um, and they do this through the xylem. It's a good Scrabble word. They do this via, uh, via their xylem, which is essentially a whole bunch of little um, capillaries that make up the stalks of plants. Um, we might care about this in microfluidic um, applications. Sometimes it's, uh, it's good to have devices that can sort of pull liquid into them automatically and uh, via capillary action and do some sort of fluidic analysis um, on them. So let's sketch out what our system looks like. So imagine we have a dish of water and we have a straw sticking down into that water. And there's some fluid level in the dish, and I'm going to kind of exaggerate things 
over here, but the fluid inside gets drawn up to, to some level inside the straw. So here's the, here's the dish, and here's a straw, aka a capillary, um, and some fluid gets drawn up from the dish from the dish into the straw. So take a moment now, pause the video, and think about what sort of parameters might be important, right? So, you know, what, what interfaces, what interfaces exist and what properties of the interfaces are important, are important. What other problem parameters for exist, uh, exist for, you know, for example, is there gravity? What sort of geometrical aspects are uh, is important, right? Does the um, do, cer do certain geometries of the dish uh, or of the straw or of other things matter? So let's sort of we're going to gather together a whole bunch of problem parameters, and we're going to use them all to try to predict what is the height. What is the height, little h, that uh, that the liquid gets drawn up to in equilibrium in this straw. So take a moment now, pause the video, and try to gather together what problem parameters might be important in order for, to, to predict this. So let's try to make this prediction, little h, in terms of properties of the fluid or of the interfaces or of the system, um, things that we could measure rather than things, uh, you know, things that we could measure or things that we could look up or things that we already know. So some things that I think might be important in trying to solve this problem. Uh, well, first, if you imagine if we have this dish and we have this straw, we might think about gravity. Um, you know, gravity essentially trying to, trying to pull the fluid down. Capillary action is trying to pull the fluid up. So we're sort of in a battle between gravity and capillary action. So we might think, hey, wait a second, gravity you know, gravity is, uh, is pulling this down. So let's, let's treat gravity, g, the acceleration due to gravity, as a known parameter. So, so I'm going to put all of my known parameters in blue, and unknowns I'm going to leave in red. So just to sort of keep the bookkeeping a little bit easier. So, so our knowns, we're basically going to do gravity, the gravitational acceleration is... You know, we all know G, 9.81 meters per second squared. Um, what else might be, uh, might be some things that we might know about this system? Well, if we, if we had, you know, done an experiment prior to doing this capillary rise, if we had done a contact angle experiment with a droplet um, on the solid surface, again, we said contact angle experiments are pretty good. You know, you saw one just a couple minutes ago we could measure this contact angle. So that's something we could know to sort of give us information about surface tensions between air and fluid and solid. Again, sometimes we don't necessarily, sometimes it's hard to look up or we don't necessarily know what these individual surface tensions are, but we, but we might know, for example, what the contact angle is between the liquid and the solid. So we could basically say, hey, there's some contact angle um, there's some contact angle that we know, and I'll, I'll give this theta sub c uh, that we might know. Um, so sometimes, so when you're trying to characterize new solids or things like that, um, generally the solid vapor surface tension and the solid liquid surface tension, those are things that you might not be able to look up. But you can oftentimes look up, you know, in a book or on the internet or whatever, liquid vapor surface tensions are pretty, um, pretty well known. You know, you can type in the Google or whatever, what is the liquid vapor surface tension between air and water? And then, boop, it'll tell you the answer. So, liquid vapor surface tension, liquid vapor surface tension is something that we can, we could treat as, we could treat as a known. Um, and then finally, I said, hey, wait a second, there might be some, some geometry um, of the problem that might be important. 
And qualitatively, you might you might know this. Um, you know, here we have some liquid going up in a straw of a certain diameter. Um, but if we talk about plants drinking water, we know plants can pull water all the way up to their leaves, much more than the few millimeters that we saw grow, um, growing up in the straw. So, you know, the height that this goes up might depend on some geometry of the system. And in particular, it's going to depend on the radius of, of the capillary. So I'm just going to draw like the radius right here. The capillary radius, um, little r, is going to be important. And spoiler alert, the smaller r is, the higher the fluid's actually going to be able to be drawn up into it. Finally, if we think about this as a fight between gravity and surface tension, gravitational forces aren't just g, but if you think about it, it's like mg. But we, you know, we don't necessarily know exactly masses per se, but if we know what this fluid is, we might know its density. So we could basically say, hey, let's treat as a known the fluid density. Which I'm going to uh, use the Greek letter rho to indicate fluid density. So to summarize where we're going here, we're going to say we know gravity, you know, gravitational acceleration. We're going to say we already did an experiment that looked like this, where we could measure contact angle. So we could treat that as a known. We could go on Google and look up what the liquid vapor surface tension is, for example, between water and air. And we also know what, you know, we could take out a pair of calipers or do some image processing or whatever, and we could measure what the radius of the capillary is. We're also saying we know what fluid we're dealing with here, water. You could again, look on Google, figure out what the density of water is. And all of these uh, so we can treat sort of all of these parameters as known, and spoiler alert, with physics, all we'll need to know is these parameters to allow us to predict what the height of capillary rise will be. And what approach are we going to take? Well, we're going to take this energy per area approach that we talked about um, just a minute ago. So we talked about it qualitatively here, right? The areas change in order to sort of minimize their overall energy. Well, in this case, when we were talking about these droplets, we were ju talking just about their surface energy. But for this system over here, we're going to try to minimize uh, try to minimize the overall energy. And the overall energy is going to have two contributors one contribution from surface energy. But if we think about this as a battle between gravity and capillary, uh, gravity and surface tension, this capillary rise being a battle between gravity and surface tension, you know, some part of that energy for the system is going to be surface energy, but there's also going to be gravitational potential energy. So we're going to try to, so we're going to figure out, we're going to develop an equation for the overall system energy in terms of known parameters. And uh, we're going to express the overall system energy as the sum of surface energy and gravitational potential energy. And then we're going to say, hey, what h, what little h here will minimize my overall system energy? Um, such that it's a balance between surface energy and gravitational potential, potential energy that minimizes this overall system energy. And last but not least, I'm going to include a term here, one more quote-unquote known, that won't actually be important for the final answer, but will be very helpful in our development of this. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say, hey, you know, it would be relatively straightforward to know what the height, what the overall height of the straw is. So the total straw height, which I'll put as capital H. And spoiler alert, capital H actually isn't going to affect the overall result here, right? You could, you know, you, I could make this straw just barely bigger than little h, or, you know, as high as the Empire State Building. Um, it wouldn't affect what the little h is going to be, but uh, just defining this as some known constant is going to help us in our development of the solution. 
So if I'm defining, if I'm trying to minimize my overall system energy, well, I gotta define what that system is, right? And similar to how we thought about defining a control volume to sort of talk about a system here, um, we should think about defining a control volume for this system right here. And the control volume that I'm going to, going, to, going to define is basically the part that just barely coincides with the interface of the interior and the straw. So my system is basically this interface, is the interior, is everything in the interior surface of the straw. So it's everything in the interior, like just against the interior surface of the straw, plus all of the contents, you know, plus the water and the air and stuff that's in there. So that's my system. So where are we going? So I can say my total system energy is going to be a sum of surface energies and gravitational potential energies. So let's square, uh, let's do gravitational potential energy first and then we'll do surface energies after. So first, if we think about gravitational potential energy, I should kind of define my, my zero, my y equals zero right here. And if I think about gravitational potential energy, well, um, you know, what's gravitational potential energy? Well, gravitational potential, en potential energy is m times g times, uh, times the height of the center of mass. So I'll just do h of the center of mass right here. So, uh, and again, m, we'll, we'll, worry, we'll, we'll put m in terms of knowns in just a second, and we'll also put the height of the center of mass in terms of knowns in just a second as well. And of course, g is there. And then if I think about surface energies, if you remember, surface energy is basically going to be equal to some surface tension times some area of the interface. So we need to so we need to consider those. And if I think about what's going on inside the straw, I think there there are basically two surfaces that are going to be important here. There's a solid vapor surface right here on the top part of the straw, and there's a solid liquid interface right here in the interior of the straw. And strictly speaking, there are three other surfaces as well. There's a liquid-liquid surface right here, but of course that's, you know, there's no surface energy associated with that because it's liquid in contact with more liquid. And up here, there's air in contact with air. Again, there's no surface there. And here, you know, there's a little bit of interfacial surface energy right here, but this, the, the shape of this surface doesn't really change depending on where the height is. So I'm not too, I'm not too worried about this area here. I'm mostly just worried about this area and this area. Um, so these are the areas that are basically going to dominate um, the, the surface energy of the system. So we have uh, surface tension and it times an area of the interface. So, uh, so what's that going to look like? Well, um, so if I wanted to talk about this, I would say, hey, there's some solid liquid surface tension and there's some area of the solid liquid interface. So there's some surface tension between the solid and liquid and there's some area of that. And there's also some solid vapor surface tension and some area of the solid vapor interface. So we have our overall system energy and we have a whole bunch of terms here. But unfortunately, if we think about this, we have some terms here and all of these terms that I've kind of briefly underlined here and that I've colored in black are terms that hopefully we'll be able to put in terms of knowns or little h, but we haven't yet exactly done that. So now let's do some steps where we can try to put some of these terms in terms of constants that we know and care about. So let's just do that left to right. So we're gonna say our total system energy. Well, if I think about m, um, what is the mass of this? Well, I'm going to neglect the mass of the air 
and just look at the mass of the fluid in here. Well, what's the mass of the fluid? Well, I think about what the mass of the fluid is. The mass of the fluid is the density times the volume of that fluid. Well, hey, wait a second, what's the volume of this? Well, if I think about it, this is sort of like a cylinder of fluid. And what's the volume of a cylinder? Well, the volume of a cylinder is gonna be pi r squared times the height of that cylinder, and the height of that cylinder is going to be little h. So this mass term is the volume times the density. We still have g. And then, well, what is the height of the center of mass of this chunk of fluid? Well, the height of the center of mass, um, it's not the same as this h here, but it's related to it. If I think about it, if the fluid is drawn up to a height little h, the center of mass of that chunk of fluid is halfway up that total height. So the height of the center of mass is little h over 2, right? Or 1 half h. The center of mass is in the middle of that chunk of fluid, and uh, if the total height of the chunk of fluid is little h, then the center of mass associated with the gravitational potential energy would be h over 2. So there we are. So now we have our gravitational potential energy entirely in terms of knowns or things that we're trying to solve for h. All right, let's see if we can chip away at some of these next terms. So I'm going to leave the surface, the solid liquid and the solid vapor surface tensions in there for now, um, and we'll deal with them later. So solid liquid surface tension. But we can make progress at trying to figure out what, this, what the area of the solid liquid interface is. So if I think about it, there's a solid liquid interface right here um, where the solid is touching the liquid. And I might think about the area of that interface being sort of a cylinder if I just kind of unwrapped that cylinder here. And in that case, the area of that sort of unwrapped cylinder, the area of the interface between the solid and liquid is going to be h, right? If I take this and unwrap it, it has a height of little h. Um, and the perimeter, the perimeter of that circle is going to sort of be the other part, the other factor in that area. So the perimeter is just going to be 2 pi r. Now, last but not least, we have our solid vapor part up here. So again, we're just going to leave the surface tensions in there for now. We'll deal with them later. And, but we can put these areas in terms, of, uh, in terms of some knowns. So if I think about it, this also is, this, is the interface between the solid and vapor is also a sort of cylindrical surface that I can kind of unwrap and consider that area. And in this case, the height of this part of the cylinder is just whatever the whole height of the straw is minus little h. So what's that going to look like? So one dimension of my sort of unwrapped rectangle is going to be big H minus little h. Um, and, it, and it still has the same perimeter as the other one, 2 pi r. So that's going to be the area. This one is the area of the solid vapor interface. So what did I say we're trying to do? We're trying to find and a little h that minimizes this function. So we're trying to find a little h that minimizes this function of h. Hey, wait a second. Do we know how to, if we have a function, how do we find a function's minimum or maximum? Hmm. Consider for a second. If I have a function and want to find its min or its max, what sort of mathematical tools do I have to do that? Hmm. Wait a second. I dust off the old high school calculus. If I want to find the min or a max of a function, I can take its derivative with respect to with respect to little h. Right, if I want to find an h that minimizes this function, I can take the derivative of this function with respect to h and set it equal to 0. 
And whatever h gives me a zero for this function is either going to be a min or a max. Spoiler alert, for us, it's going to be a min. So put a little more mathematically, we're going to take the derivative derivative of our total energy with respect to h. We're going to take the derivative of this function with respect to h, and we're going to set it equal to 0. So what's that going to look like? Well, if I think it, if I if I just as an aside, look at this term here. This first term is uh, rho pi r squared g over 2 times h squared. And if I take the derivative of this term with respect to h, well, all the stuff out here, all that is constants. And um, so then I have a rho pi r squared g over 2. And then if I take the derivative of h squared with respect to h, well, I could dust off the high school calculus. You bring the, you bring the 2 down, and there we have it here. So, um, and then if we could do a further simplification where the two, and the 2 in the numerator here would cancel out with that 2 in the denominator right there. The next terms, uh, the next two terms are a little more straightforward right here. If I look at this first term, constant, 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 there's only an h. So there's a whole bunch of constants times h. I take the derivative of those constants times h with respect to h. So then... Uh, when I take the derivative of this term with respect to h, basically I'm left with just the constants. So I have my solid liquid surface tension and my 2 pi r right here. And then if I think about it for the second term, I could sort of take these constants and do this distributive rule where I take a whole bunch of constants times a, big H and then a whole bunch of constants times minus little h. I could distribute those all out. If I think about the first term, constant times big H, a bunch of other constants times big H, if I take the derivative of all those terms with respect to H, it's just derivatives of constants. Derivatives of constants is going to be zero, right? So, um, so we basically get a zero for the first half of this. And then when I distribute all of this stuff times minus H for the second half, I get um, just a minus... Uh, solid vapor surface tension times 2 pi r. So take a moment now. We have some algebra here. Let's see if you can solve that for little h. All right, so I took the liberty of solving that equation for little h, and I got little h is equal to uh, minus... solid liquid surface tension minus solid vapor surface tension times well, 2 pi r over pi r squared times rho times g. And of course, some of this stuff cancels out. So what can I do? So what can I do there? Well, um, we get, we still have minus solid liquid surface tension minus solid vapor surface tension, and we have uh, 2 over R times rho times G. If you dust off your notes from last time, right, or if you go all the way back to our discussion, or to our more detailed discussion, of force uh, of the interpret of the force for length interpretation of surface tension. You remember we ha we developed an equation that related liquid vapor surface tension, solid vapor surface tension, and solid liquid surface tension. And I'll just put that equation down here for you. So it turns out that the solid vapor surface tension is equal to the solid liquid surface tension plus the liquid vapor surface tension times the cosine of the contact angle. And 
you can get this from doing a force balance on the contact line right here. So, uh, so I'm not just pulling this equation out of thin air. Um, you can dust off your notes from the previous lecture and you can basically say, hey, wait a second. I can put solid vapor and solid liquid surface tension in terms of liquid vapor surface tension and the contact angle. And all of that, um, you can see, oh, hey, wait a second. If I just do a little bit of algebra on this equation and plug it, right, if I do some algebra on this equation and I plug it in up here, I can make a further simplica simplification to this top equation where I can get everything entirely in terms of knowns. So what is that going to look like when I, when I make that substitution? Here we go. It is two times the liquid vapor surface tension times the cosine of our contact angle, all divided by rho times g times r. Hey, wait a second. We've done it. What did we do? We gave, we used physics to be able to predict the height of capillary rise, right? To be able to predict the height that fluid went up in our capillary, in our straw. And we predicted H entirely in terms of things that are known, like gravity, or things that are pretty straightforward to measure, like the density of a fluid, the diameter of a capillary, or a relatively straightforward contact angle experiment like here. Like we actually just did at the beginning of this lecture where we sort of just looked at the side of a droplet and inferred the angle. So what does this mean? We can predict the height of capillary rise given all of these parameters here. Anytime we get a super awesome result like this, I like to do a few sanity checks. So the first sanity check that I like to do is do the units make sense? Let's say, hey, let's, let's look at the units on one side of the equation. You know, what, are, what units should H have? And then look at the units for all these other terms on the right-hand side of the equation. And the units on both sides of the equation better line up, right? If they haven't, then we've probably made some mistake. We've lost some term. We've, you know, done some mathematical error. So let's look at the units, right? So if I think about the units on the left-hand side, height, should have units of meters, right, if we're working in SI. And we want to say, hey, wait a second, do meters equal whatever I get when I plug in all the units for everything on the other side of the equation? So if I think about liquid vapor surface tension, that's going to be uh, newtons per meter, right? If we, if we say surface tension has units of force per length, surface tension is going to have units of newtons per meter, and the cosine of, of an angle, well, that's just not going to have any units at all. So we're just going to put nothing in there. Density is going to have units of kilograms per cubic meter. G is going to have units of meters per second squared. And R is going to have units of meters. Well, and at a first pass, at a first pass, we have newtons and kilograms. At a first pass, things don't necessarily, necessarily line up. But if we dust off the old high school physics, we remember, hey, wait a second, a newton is actually a kilogram meter per second squared. So a newton per meter is going to be a kilogram meter per second squared per meter. And our denominator is going to be kilograms meters cubed meters per second squared times meters. So let's see if things line up. Well, these meters cancel with those meters. In the numerator, we have 1 over second squared. In the denominator, we have 1 over second squared. So those cancel. Um, we have kilograms and kilograms. So those cancel. And then in, in the denominator, we have... Wait a second, did I lose something? Nope, I didn't lose anything. We have meters on the left-hand side. So we can do a further simplification. We have 1 over, we have meters, meters, meters cubed. So we have 1 over 1 over meters. 1 over 1 over meters is just going to be meters, which equals meters on the other side. Woohoo! The units balance out. 
That means it doesn't guarantee that we didn't make a mistake, but it means that uh, if, if we did make a mistake, then it might have shown up here. The second sanity check that we can do is basically say, hey, as things get As things on the right-hand side get big or get small, how does that affect h, right? How does that affect our prediction of h? So let's take a look at how a couple of these terms, you know, how if we change some of these terms to get big or get small, what would be their effect on h? Well, let's, let's actually start with the, the terms in the denominator because I think they're a little easier to interpret and then we'll, then we'll square away some of the numerator terms, right? So, if density gets big, then this equation would predict that h gets small. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, right? If we have a lot heavier, a lot denser of a fluid, then it's going to be harder for surface tension to pull that up, the straw. So we're not going to be able to pull it up as far. Let's think about g. So as g goes up, h also goes down. Well, Let's, uh, does that make sense? Well, yeah, I mean, I guess if we live in a world, if we lived on Jupiter where gravity is a lot harder to pull against, the fluid's not going to be able to rise quite as high up the straw, right? Um, it's going to, we're going to have to pay a lot more gravitational potential energy to pull that fluid up. So as gravity goes up, H is going down. Finally, for the denominator terms anyway, as little r goes up, h goes down. And this fits with our physical intuitions, right? If I took a sewer pipe and put that in, in, a, um, you know, in a cup of water, we wouldn't notice the water just rushing up the sewer pipe at all, right? We wouldn't notice hardly any capillary rise. You only notice capillary rise, you only really notice capillary rise in capillaries, right? In tubes where the radius is really small. So if we have tubes that have really big radius, we get hardly any height. Whereas if we have really narrow tubes that have small radii, then the height can actually be very large. So it makes sense. As the radius of the pipe goes up, we, this capillary effect, this capillary rise goes away. So let's, let's, square, let's square away this, this term in the numerator. What is the effect of contact angle on H? Well, as contact angle goes up, the cosine of the contact angle actually goes down, right? And if, if you looked at, you know, what is, what is cosine theta versus theta, is, you know, up until we get to 180 degrees, as theta goes up, the cosine actually goes down, right? So um, as theta goes up, cosine of theta goes down. And if cosine of theta is going down, that basically also means that H is going down. So what does this mean? Uh, as our contact angle goes up, H goes down. Let's, let's interpret this in terms of hydrophobic and hydrophilic surfaces. So what does this mean? If we have a large contact angle, then that's associated with a hydrophobic material. If we had a large contact angle, right, if we had a large contact angle, then H would go down. Well, heck yeah, right? Of course, we're not going to get very much capillary rise if we used a hydrophobic straw to try to pull it up, right? A hydrophilic straw with a really small contact angle, right? The smaller the contact angle, the more hydrophilic the material is and the more capillary rise we're going to get, right? So if we did the opposite of this, if contact angle were really small, then we would get a really large H, and that would be consistent with our interpretation of a hydrophilic material being able to pull the fluid up the straw a lot. So thus concludes our discussion of capillary rise and how surface tension can pull some fluid up a straw, not indefinitely up the straw, but only until the point where it minimizes, this, where it minimizes the total system energy as a balance between gravitational potential energy and surface energy. But we're not done our discussion of, even though we're just done discussing capillary rise, we're not done with our discussion of surface energies, 
uh, or surface tensions interpretation of energy over area. So let's do a little thought experiment. Let's imagine I have uh, two surfaces. Um, you know, or, or you know, I'm, I'm look I'm looking at a surface, and let's say I have one surface that's really smooth. and then another surface that's really rough, right? And then let's say, you know, I have my, you know, I have some fluid, right, like this, and I take my fluid and I take that fluid and put it on the smooth surface. And I also take this fluid and put it on the rough surface. Um, is the contact angle gonna change? Will contact anger differ between, you know, whatever contact angle the, the fluid would have on the smooth surface versus whatever contact angle it would have on the rough surface? So our first question is, will that contact angle differ? Um, and the second question you should think about is, um, in what way will it differ? Will it increase or decrease? Is there more information that you need to know? Something like that. So take a moment, pause the video, and consider if I had a smooth surface versus a rough surface, and I put some fluid, you know, some fluid on the smooth surface, some fluid on the rough surface, and, you know, uh, and considered the uh, sort of observed, the observed or the apparent contact angle, would roughening the surface cause the apparent contact angle or the observed contact angle to increase or decrease. Well, before I give you the answer of whether roughening the surface will increase or decrease the contact angle, let's do an actual physical experiment. So imagine I have some fluid and I, you know, just, just put some fluid, you know, I, I get my desk all wet and I have two materials, um, a paper towel, and a chunk of wood. Well, if we think about it, there's a paper towel and a chunk of wood. They're both basically made of cellulose. I mean, the wood has a little bit of lignin too, but so does the paper towel. These two things are actually made of almost identical materials. So which one is gonna be, you know, which one is going to appear to be more hydrophilic? Well, I could try to, I could try to sop up this liquid with the wood. It doesn't do a very good job. But this paper towel, you know, uh, I'm not trying to make like a bounty commercial here, but the paper towel does a perfectly fine job at cleaning up this surface. So chemically, there's not that much different, but different between the wood and the paper. The main difference between the, or the, between the wood and the paper towel is the wood is at least more, much more smooth than the paper towel. The paper towel is like, you know, infinitely rough. It's like individual fibers. So, um, so the paper towel appears to be more hydrophilic. The paper towel, i.e. more surface area, appears to be more, appears to be more hydrophilic. So one might say, oh, well, increasing roughness should, should decrease contact angle. But then I would offer this counterexample. So I'm going to offer this counterexample from biology. So there are these uh, water bugs or water striders that can basically, you know, if you looked at them from the top, you know, here's the bug's body and they have these legs. And they can basically sit on the surface. So here's a top view. And the bugs, doop, doop, they can basically sit on the surface of water. And if you zoomed way in to their legs, right, if you looked, if you looked at their leg and then did a side view, 
So if you zoomed way in on what the side of a water bug's leg looks like, you know, here's, here's the leg, and this leg actually has a bunch of waxy hairs. And if we think about wax, wax is a very hydrophobic material. And waxy hairs basically have, it's hydrophobic and lots of surface area. And when I think about the, this waxy, hairy leg um, sitting on the surface of the water, the water is like this, and the water doesn't want to interact with these waxy hairs on the leg. So the large amount of surface area that the waxy hairs give the tip of the leg actually sort of increase the hydrophobicity. So if I think about paper towels, paper towels, surface area appears to make it more hydrophilic. In this case, surface area appears more surface area makes it appear to be more hydrophobic. So, what's going on, right? There's there's there seems to be some contrast here, right? So, you know, will contact angle anger differ, differ? Usually. Yes, but will it increase or decrease? The answer is depends. And the key takeaway here is roughness amplifies an already existing Ampli uh, roughness amplifies an already existing effect. So for water bugs, wax is, is a little bit hydrophobic, but a waxy rough haired tip of the water bug leg makes it appear very hydrophobic. And wood is a little bit hydrophilic, right? You can see the, the, the water did soak into the surface of the wood, but if you used something that's the same material but a lot more rough, i.e. has a lot more surface area, it sops up that water just fine, like this paper towel did. So roughness amplifies an already existing effect on, of surface tension. So one last experiment. So, um, so we were look, we were earlier we were looking at this side of my water bottle right here, and now let's look at this side. So on this side, I have one patch of the water bottle that's nice and smooth, right? You can see the, the light reflecting off it. It's nice and smooth. And then I have this other patch right here that's very rough. I basically took some sandpaper and chick, 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 you know, roughened up this surface here. So now I want you to make a prediction. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take water and I'm gonna put one drop on the smooth part and one drop on the rough part. And I want you to predict which one is going to have the higher contact angle, the smooth or the rough part. Take a second, pause the video. Um, and then I'll show you the result. So what's the answer? Well, if I look at these two droplets from the side right here, these two droplets from the side right here, the contact angles are actually almost identical. And what's the reason? Well, if you look at the contact angle for this droplet, um, on the smooth surface, the contact angle started off very close to 90 degrees, right? If we look at this, this edge right here, whoops, I just touched it. But if you look at the edge right there before I messed it up, the at contact angle was close to 90 degrees. And if the contact angle is close to 90 degrees, it's basically a perfect balance. It's, it's neither particularly hydrophobic nor particularly hydrophilic, hydrophilic. So if we go back to this idea that roughness amplifies an already existing effect, um, if, if, it, if it had zero, if, you know, if it was neither hydrophilic nor hydrophobic to begin with, then making it rougher or, rougher or smoother isn't really going to change that at all. The end. So, thanks for watching, and I hope you learned uh, a little bit more about the interpretation of surface tension as energy per unit area. Um, 
Hope you learned a little bit about capillary rise and hope you learned a little bit about the effect of roughness on the apparent contact angle or the apparent hydrophilicity and hydrophobicity of a material.